A while ago, I was doing a bit of cleaning around my house, and while I was looking through some storage containers, I stumbled on a VHS player and a bunch of old tapes from my childhood. Out of pure curiosity, I decided to take it out and set up the player. Then, after looking at some of the tapes I had, I decided to put one in, just to see what was on there. And holy sh**. The amount of pure nostalgia I was experiencing probably could have killed me. This may seem a bit sad, but it was such a surreal experience, basically reliving a small part of my childhood. For the rest of the day, all I could think about was some of the stuff I used to watch on TV as a kid. I mean, do any other Australians remember waking up in the morning or coming home from school to sit down in front of the TV to watch Elliot on Roller Coaster? Ah yes, the nostalgia. Or how about on the weekends when we used to watch Saturday Disney on Channel 7 because you woke up too early and ABC was playing Rage all morning? Rage! Let me know in the comments if your week looked different to mine, but I'm confident this is the typical Australian kid TV experience if you're growing up around about the late 90s slash early noughties. All that aside, my main source of entertainment came from the ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Just like the BBC or PBS, it's a government-owned and funded station that was basically a young kid's paradise. Coming home to watch Australian classics like The Puzzle Brush Show was in a May- Actually, Drizzle, The Puzzle Brush Show was British. Excuse me, what? Huh. O okay, um... Here, how about this? Does anyone remember watching Cornel and Bernie? How about George Strings? I love these shows so much. I'd go them so far as to call them a staple of... Canadian and French entertainment. Um, <clears throat> you know what, how about a newer show? I'm sure one of those come from here. How about Ruby, Gloom, or Spice? Two weird shows that are also very... Canadian. Ah! Okay, so it turns out that the large majority of the shows I watched as a kid came from literally everywhere else besides Australia. But after a few minutes of fact-checking, I've managed to create a list of five Australian shows that I remember watching as a kid, and I'd like to share them all with you. To try and keep this video shorter, I'll be massively oversimplifying the episodes I feature. If you want more context, I'll be uploading a reaction reel of each episode eventually. It's basically like I Hate Everything's Trying to Watch series, so if you like that, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss it. Without further ado, let's begin by visiting the most famous lighthouse in the country. Round the Twist was one of the first shows that came to my mind when I was making this list, and to give you a comparison, it's basically the Aussie version of Goosebumps, but subjectively a lot better. However, I will be taking off nostalgia points because this show plays the same sound effect of a muffled trumpet for almost every single interaction. Anyway, the show focuses on the Twist family, Tony the dad, Pete, Linda and Bronson, who moved from the city to a lighthouse in the town of Port Noranda, Victoria. The episode Skeleton on the Dunny is about them actually moving into the lighthouse. Although immediately as they arrive, things start going to shit, including Bronson. I feel bad for this kid, he like clearly has to go. <laughs> so we find out that the original owner of the lighthouse, Neil, this lady, was overseas and the person who was looking after the lighthouse named Ned was found dead on the dunny I mentioned before. They never explain why though, so go ahead and speculate in the comments. She also lost a painting that was important to her, which will be relevant later on. If someone hadn't the pinched family. my painting, I might have raised the overdraft myself. It was an original clique. Fast forward a bit and Bronson is so desperate to go to the loo and so scared to go alone that he has to go ask his sister... Would you go to the dunny with me? Don't be such a wimp. Brother... And dad to go with him. <laughs> they all say no, so he mans up and goes by himself. Surprise, surprise, he sees the ghost and no one believes him. No such things as ghosts. In fact, he is so convinced that the ghost will do something, he even follows his sister into the loo to protect her. Are you still in there, Linda? Nah, she fell in. Isn't Bronson? Nick off! Nick off, your dog. I'm beginning to think he has some... Some... Scary... Some uh, in inappropriate interests. Are we going to have to have like, the Pornhub like, community intro no. before this? <laughs> no, instead the end bit, it's the trumpet. <laughs> 
So all the kids inevitably need to go, and they all finally see the ghost that's haunting the dunny. Skip forward a day, and all three kids are found face to face with the ghost, who turns out to be dead Ned from before. And remember that painting Neil was looking for? Turns out it was in the dunny itself. For some reason. Regardless, the ghost vanishes into space, Neil gets the painting back, and the episode ends. So, that was a... Uh... Around the twist, is it as good as you remembered, or...? I think, you know, because that was the first episode, it definitely probably wasn't exciting as the later ones, but, like, just because of the nostalgia, I really love it. Honestly, first episode, obviously, it's got to set some things up, they're moving in, but because of the nostalgia, I will always love every single episode and every single minute, every single second of the goddamn show. Fair enough. I'm going to rate the first episode 8 out of 10, and every episode after that is going to be an 11 out of 10. All right. Honestly, I'm gonna seven or a six because that saxophone. I just I can't. I, I, if that play, I don't know how I could have survived Actually, yeah. as a child. You know what? That's a good point because of the saxophone. It, get, it gets like two points knocked off. Six out of ten. Bananas in Pajamas is a show that has been slowly driving me ever closer to insanity ever since I rediscovered it. I don't know if I'm just being a complete drongo, but for every second I watched this show, I was left with ten questions. Like, why do anthropomorphic bananas exist? Why are they wearing sleeping garments? Are there any other anthropomorphic fruits in this universe? Are they partners? Are they brothers? Why the fuck are they friends with a bunch of bears and a glorified con artist? Are these six people the only people in the universe? How are they born? Is this some kind of sick social experiment conducted by the Australian government? So the show follows the lives of the creatively named B1 and B2, their neighbours the Teddies, Morgan, Lulu and Amy, and their friend Rat in the Hat. In this episode, we learn that every single Tuesday, the bananas like to chase the Teddies. Chase... The teddies. What the fuck? Okay, why are two grown pieces of fruit chasing around their neighbors? All right, why? Why are they okay with this? No, no, actually, you know what? Hold on, hold on, shut up. Why? What are the bananas gonna do with the teddies if they catch them? All right, that's my question. I hate Tuesdays. They make me so tired. You're so tired. That's not the reaction you should be having. Why are you calling the police? Why the f am I being chased by? Bananas. After the bananas finish chasing down Morgan and Amy, they decide to hunt down Lulu. She's at rat shops getting groceries for the week. After staring her down for a bit, they jump inside the shop and proceed to chase her around until Lulu locks them in a room off to the side. Being justifiably distraught, Lulu vents her frustration saying that I hate Tuesdays! I wish there was no such days as Tuesdays! To which Rat, the clever man he is, provides a solution, which is to give her a calendar where all of the Tuesdays have been removed. Huh. Present. I mean, Jacob, when you think about it, this makes perfect sense. I mean, like, if there aren't any Tuesdays, then the bananas can't chase the teddies. Don't worry about the fact that a calendar made by the world's dodgiest rat doesn't define time. It doesn't matter. These, at, at least they can't chase around a bunch of bears anymore. Rat in the hat, more like gut amongst men because he's such a bloody genius. So the teddies then break into the bananas house and replace their calendar with the one that doesn't have Tuesdays on it. And their relief only lasts for a few seconds where the bananas come back with their own calendar. We don't need that calendar anymore because every day on our new calendar is... And then the bananas chase the teddies and eat their corpses. <laughs> so, Jacob, thoughts on bananas in pyjamas? Well, I give it... Three potential sex predator bananas out of five. All right, you know what? Just because it was so traumatizing, I'm going to give it uh, two restraining orders out of ten. Do you regret agreeing to do this, by the way? Oh, 100%. <laughs> The Upside Down show is a lot cringier than I remember it being. Honestly, I feel like this is a case of children like TV shows that have funny noises and quirky character syndrome, where 99% of the things we thought were good turn out to be just absolutely horrible. With this being no exception. Meet Shane and David, two brothers who are the living embodiment of schizophrenia. Where's my horsey? Where's my horsey? They for some reason have a magic remote that they give to the audience. Thought so. Here you go. Be careful. Got it? Okay, good. It can control elements of real life such as freezing people. Paused. To weirder things like making someone trip over. Or even making everything dark. I think someone pressed the dark button. 
We never get to know where this magic remote comes from. But watching two pieces of fruit harass their neighbors has made me want to avoid further questions like I'm avoiding a bunch of rabies infected raccoons. So for now, it will remain a mystery. Anyway, in this episode, we find that Shane and David are making a cowboy slash pirate slash space themed movie with their sock puppet roommate. <laughs> Canal. <laughs> It used to be much better than this, I swear. Oh, shing, ting, 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 ting. What the f***? <laughs> <laughs> Regardless, this entire episode is just about them trying to get to a movie theater so they can watch their film. Now, one thing you need to know about this show is that all the doors in the house lead to different locations. Not to other parts of the house. Oh no, that would actually make sense. I mean places like... An infinitely long laundromat, an infinitely long dance hall, and a white room with nothing but a chair. <laughs> sure, why not? Basically, both Shane and David visit all three of these rooms thinking that they are in the movie theater. In the laundromat, they think that the washing machine itself is the movie screen. Yeah, it's, it's fluffier than I remember. And it's very repetitive. What do you mean? I mean, it's very repetitive. What do you mean? I mean, it's very repetitive. What do you mean? I mean, it's very repetitive. What do you mean? I mean, it's very repetitive. In the dance hall, they think that the mirror is the movie screen. That bo that bar along the mirror looks so fake. Because it is. They just stuck a JPEG on. <laughs> I don't even think it's cropped properly. You can still see a bit of the white outline. Do you see it? <laughs> yeah, you see it. <laughs> and in the infinite white room, they find a chair thinking it's a seat in the theater. <laughs> Until they finally come back to discover the theater was in their house all along. <gasps> Movie theater! <laughs> Canal. So everyone finally arrives at the movie theater, and we finally get to sit down and watch the fruits of Shane and David's labor. And who would have thought that it would have been god awful? And what's he floating in? Oh, well, space. <laughs> oh, sh it, it's an Alamal. I love it. <laughs> oh my god. What do pirates do? Ting 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 ting. Cross the gap. I. Oh my god. I slap squadron. He slap squadron. <laughs> yeah, but the, the rest of the show makes uh, this slap redeemed. Squad. Redeemed. No. Redeemed. Why is the alien? <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of popcorn. Sally Bollywood is the greatest piece of media that this country has ever exported to the world. Never before have I seen such astonishing animation produced in my entire life. From the character design, to the backgrounds, to something as simple as characters facial expressions, or even the transition of shots, the amount of fine details is a testament to the dedication of the animation team. Ha. Huh. Oh my What the, f what the hell? That's holy oh, shit, that's terrifying. <laughs> it's 2 a.m. in the water, you wake up and you hear some creaking. You, you turn on your light and you see that. Just you see that on your fucking wall. <laughs> Even the music in the series is on par with David Bowie, with songs featuring profound and emotive lyrics such as... Sally, the brave detective. Bollywood is her name. Nah, nah. <laughs> nah, 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 nah. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> So the show is about Sally and her friend Dewey, two friends who run a bootleg detective agency called the SBI, where they go and solve various mysteries that unfold around their school. Also, sorry that the audio quality of this episode is so shit, I literally had to get a French version of the episode and get the English audio from YouTube because ABC iView took down the original episode and I couldn't find it anywhere else. This episode is no longer available in iView. Programs are normally available for 14 days. Well, that, that's just not good enough then, is it, ABC? In this episode, we find that someone has managed to hack into the school speaker system, and over the course of a few days, they play sound effects of gushing water. An evacuation siren. Uh, remain calm. Subliminal messages that make people sleepy. Sleep 
train noises. And they are constantly ringing the lesson bell. Ah, oh, that's what it is. It's, it's speakers with, with the. Okay, so you have the opportunity to play anything you f***ing want on a speaker, but no, let's like mildly annoy everyone. So now it's up to Sally and Dewey to find out who is mildly annoying everyone. After a bit of investigating, they essentially find out that the person who hacked the speaker system had this very specific brand of clothes. And after a bit of narrowing down, they suspect it's one of these three guys. Albert, Martin, or Benjamin. Fucking nerds. <laughs> They rule out Ben because he was a victim to the subliminal messages from before. And then Martin basically dogs out Albert by giving Sally enough information so she can track a drone back to Albert, who has been hiding in the library spying on everyone. It's getting intense now. It's getting f***ing intense. Oh my oh. god. I knew it. You knew it. I knew it. Day one. Day one. So it turns out that Albert hacked into the speaker system so that he could show how sound can affect people in his science project. I'm preparing a brilliant to teach the effects of sound on students. Because using your classmates as guinea pigs in a manipulative experiment isn't f***ed up at all. So, final thoughts on the amazing masterpiece that is Sally Bollywood. I called it, like, day one. I knew it was that Albert piece of sh I, I knew it, I saw him in the beginning, I was like, yep, yeah, that looks that looks like the guy that's gonna be causing the, the shenanigans in this bloody episode, and you know what, I was right. And because of that, I rate Sally Bollywood 10 out of 10, for... <laughs> because it made me feel like I, I'm a detective myself, alright? It really immersed me in the universe. You feel? Not really. Well, f*** off then. <laughs> Tracy! 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 Tracy, you fucking dog! Tracy McBean is basically Australia's Jimmy Neutron. Don't at me. She's an Aussie schoolgirl who basically makes a lot of really strange inventions that help her get through some of the most stupid situations. One of these situations unfolds on their school photo day, where her friend Seamus somehow gets freckles. Why does he have blue freckles? Seamus. I don't They're know. They're only freckles. Ah, oh, Seamus, you remind me of someone. Um, oh yeah, that's right. I had pizza last night. <laughs> like, like a you. pepperoni face. Okay, so he's complaining about pepperoni face, yet he's got fucking boils on his face. He's got three pepperonis on his fucking chin. So after Seamus has been bullied for the rest of the day, Tracy tries the logical solution of applying her mother's makeup to Seamus. But that plan ends up shit creek very quickly. Here's your makeup, mum. So logically, the next step is to build a high-powered piece of machinery to remove the freckles off Seamus' face. It spins you around so fast that the freckles just fly off your face! Yeah, yeah, Tracy, I don't think that's how it works. You're just gonna make him really sick. It's working! It's working! Oh, what do you know? It worked. Surprise, surprise, things start going to shit. I'll let Tracy explain. The supersonic spinning had somehow filled the freckles with a strange life force. Now they were out to make their mark on a freckle-free world. So Seamus' freckles start infecting everyone to the point where airplanes are being grounded and traffic is being put to a standstill. Alright, Tracy, just, just for future reference, cars have these amazing things called windscreen wipers. They, they, they even shoot water out. That way traffic doesn't have to get stuck uh, for a bunch of dots on your window. So Tracy has the brilliant idea of spinning her supersonic turbo-powered freckle remover backwards to attract the freckles back to her trailer. It's working! Oh, what do you know? It worked. Then the freckles get shot into outer space. Get abducted by aliens. Prepare to beam them aboard. Whatever happens, one thing's for sure, they'll never again freckle anyone else. And then Seamus can have a decent school photo. Okay, Charon, stay chill. Alright, Tom. Thoughts on Tracy McBean. It's a kid's show, dude. Kids shows are fucking retarded and stupid and they don't make sense, like, honestly. But they're still fucking, like, awesome when you're a kid. Oh. The longer you're stupider. Yeah, pretty and much. It's gotta be simple. And they make it simple town words so you understand. 
On a scale of 1 to 10, how much do you regret agreeing to this? Intergalactic freckles! <laughs> <laughs> so I'll take that as a 10 out of 10. You regret this. Well, there you go, guys. I hope that was a bit of a nostalgia trip for you Aussies out there. And if you are a part of the majority of people who are outside of Australia, I hope this gives you a bit of insight into what TV shows were like back then. So, do you guys remember any of these shows? What were your favourite childhood shows? Should I make a part 2 featuring even more shows that I missed out on? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you to my friend Grim Nemesis for helping out with some of the lines. Thank you to my friend Liam who helped me film some of the opening shots. Thank you to all my real life friends who agreed to watch the shows with me. And thank you all for watching my longest video yet. Until next time, my name is Drizzle.